Hello and welcome to another special edition of the Scriptures Are Real and our joint uh, broadcast with Cultural Hall. We're grateful for Richie Stedman for allowing us to, to participate this way with him. Uh, this is uh, one of those special editions where we're talking about the Holy Week and in particular today is uh, Holy Thursday, a very, very significant day, also called Maundy Thursday. Uh, you can hear the, the word for commandment in there. Uh, it's about the new, that it's gotten that name because of the new commandment. When the Savior says, new commandment I give unto you, that, that as I have loved you, you love one another. Um, and so this is a very significant day um, for all of Christendom, but probably more for us than uh, it is for many. I'm joined with uh, a a Andrew Skinner, or by Andrew Skinner, and uh, so happy to have you with us. Why don't you uh, well, welcome Andy, and then uh, why don't you uh, uh, kind of uh, start us out uh, as we talk about this wonderful day. Thank you so much, Kerry. I just have to say that it's a privilege to be associated with you and to talk about the things that matter most to all of us, so thanks. Uh, as you said, Monday, Thursday, uh, and it's spelled M-A-U-N-D-Y. Uh, I remember uh, first hearing about it uh, in college and I couldn't figure out why they were saying Monday, Thursday, but it's mm -hmm. Monday, Thursday from the Latin word for commandment, mandatum. So anyway, um, Monday, Thursday of Holy Week observances in most Christian denominations commemorates the Last Supper, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and then Jesus' last teachings to the assembled disciples after the Last Supper, especially the commandment that you made reference to, wherein Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So this idea of commandment then to love uh, is front and center in the title, Monday, Thursday. And uh, for me, the essence of the Last Supper is in fact the transformation of the Passover meal, which uh, Jewish people had been celebrating for the last 13 or 1400 years, depending on when you date the Exodus. And, uh, and it's transformed into the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And it, that is to say, the, the sacrament, along with a baptism by water and by fire, are the first and most fundamental ordinances that link us as disciples to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, the sacrament, as I think we all realize, is unique in that we may participate in this ordinance uh, for ourselves, not as proxies for other people, but for ourselves time and time again which is not true for all the other ordinances that we participate in, particularly those in the temple. So in a way, Maybe, if I... Uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, please, uh, I was going to say, in a way, then, uh, every Sabbath day is a kind of Monday, Thursday experience for Latter-day Saints, uh, as the Apostle explained it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You were going to make a comment. Yeah, and this is uh, uh, something I can't take credit for. It's uh, some thoughts that our stake presidency has been giving us that they got in some trainings. But uh, it's it's been a wonderful way for me to think about it. And I hope as uh, people are preparing, our audience is preparing to partake of the sacrament on Easter Day, they can think of it uh, and start to think about, well, this is an ordinance. Uh, and that, in a way, transforms our chapel into an ordinance room and transforms uh, our priests into ordinance workers. And uh, that's that's a, a thought. We take the, the ordinance rooms and ordinance workers and, and those ordinances in the temple so seriously, but this is no less an ordinance uh, and no less important. And uh, it, it, thinking of it that way has helped me. I've always tried to take the sacrament seriously, but it's helped me uh, think of that even more. Uh, so if I can think not only of what we'll talk about in a while of, of Gethsemane, but also of the institution of this ordinance, uh, and uh, the renewal of that covenant. I think uh, that the word covenant is is better translation than, than testament here. This, this, he is renewing the covenant. He uses language that draws on Exodus 24, that draws on uh, Jeremiah talking about a new covenant. It's very clear as he institutes the Passover, his, his disciples would have understood this as uh, a covenant 
process. Uh, if we can keep all of those things in mind, it makes it a very solemn, sacred, and and wonderful and joyous event to partake of the sacrament. Well, in just a moment, we I want to talk about as you as you do the washing of the disciples' feet, and when that takes place right after the Last Supper, the second great ordinance instituted that night in the upper room, uh, it it is doubly connected to the temple as we think about it, um, as as we will mention, because. Um, the washing of the feet has been restored in these latter days and is uh, is administered in the temple. So we get that double temple connection with the second great ordinance. Uh, I, I am particularly taken with uh, the Apostle Paul's description of what happened that Thursday night because it's such a wonderful summary. And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And I'm sure... Most everybody is familiar with these words, but uh, there are a couple of points that I think need to be emphasized or should be emphasized. So this is Paul's description to uh, uh, to the Corinthian saints, and we're not sure whether this is really the first letter or it's one of the letters that Paul sent to the Corinthian Christian community. Quote, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Unquote. So at least two points. First of all, uh, notice that uh, the, the reference to his broken body reflects what he knew would happen the very next day, that on the cross his physical body would be broken and torn for us as we sing in one of our our hymns. And then the second thing that I think is important to recognize is that that Jesus that Paul says that Jesus supped also. And I think this lays to rest the notion, and I'm not sure where it started, that Jesus didn't take or didn't participate fully in the sacrament. He didn't take the bread and he didn't uh, drink the cup of wine, uh, that that this would be reserved for the grand sacrament meeting that's uh, described in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants when he comes again at his second coming. But he did participate with them as as Paul knew and as Paul taught. So this is a, a powerful redirection of the apostles' um, commitment to him uh, as the Lord, as the one, who first instituted the Passover supper uh, some 13 or 1400 years before. And, and Jesus is saying, don't remember uh, primarily the Exodus. Don't remember the the, uh, slaying of the, of the physical Passover lamb uh, every year at this time. But when you, you partake of the sacrament, remember me. Remember me, remember me. I'm the one who instituted the the, the Passover that uh, you've been celebrating. And I'm the one who physically and spiritually brought Israel out of bondage. Remember me, remember me. And those are the words that uh, constantly come uh, to our minds as we partake of the sacrament through the prayers that have been revealed in these latter days. So I am grateful to have uh, this this unique ordinance that helps me to change every week to be better, and it it always in our minds is the fact that this came as a co- at a cost. This came as a dear cost to allow us to repent uh, and to to change and to renew our covenant and covenants every single week. 
So those are some personal thoughts that I have uh, about the sacrament. And I, I loved your, uh, your uh, reference to uh, the chapel becoming, as it were, an ordinance room, uh, because it was an ordinance room in the upper room yes. during uh, that uh, last Thursday evening of the Savior's life. Uh, anything that you wanted to add? Uh, well, maybe we don't want to take too long, but I will just say I love that transition. Uh, he takes the the Passover meal, uh, and the Passover had always looked forward to his sacrifice, and he uh, there won't be another Passover that can look forward to it because the next time they do a Passover, it's time to look backwards. And so he institutes, yeah. he changes it uh, to a new ordinance that looks back on his sacrifice, but they were both about the same thing. And that's why, as you said, it's not about remembering the lamb. The lamb was about remembering him. So now the bread and water are about remembering him from both sides of the meridian of time. We, we face ourselves and orient towards that supernal sacrifice that he was about to go through. Yeah, and it becomes clear uh, from reading the scriptures that Jesus is now regarded as the Paschal Lamb. Yes. He's regarded as the Passover, uh, to quote a phrase from, from the Gospels. So it's pretty pretty significant, pretty powerful. Uh, but things get, uh, I think, even more intense, if I can use that word, uh, even more special when Jesus then institutes the second great ordinance of Monday, Thursday, the washing of the feet. And uh, foot washing uh, is a reenacted religious rite practiced by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church on Monday, Thursday. And uh, I'm suspecting that you, like uh myself and uh, and uh, my wife and, and some of our children actually saw this done in Jerusalem a couple of times on Monday, Thursday in the plaza or the courtyard of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where they cordon off the area. Uh, and people begin to assemble as early as 730 uh, in the morning uh, to see uh, uh, this uh, this ritual or this rite performed by uh, whoever it is is designated, the archbishop or patriarch or whoever uh, is uh, designated to do that, but they select uh, individuals and then they do wash the feet to reenact this. Uh, it is um, it is moving, uh, but it's also um, very instructive because it helps you visualize how Jesus may have done this uh, in the upper room. And, and the... The washing of the feet by Jesus does three things, uh, at least three things, and probably uh, our listeners can, can think of some more things. But uh, what the washing of the feet does is, number one, Jesus demonstrates the nature of servant leadership. He illustrates uh, why the apostles themselves should not be concerned about who's the greatest among them. Because as he says, the, the greatest among, them, among us is the servant and the least of all. And, and this is a dramatic way to demonstrate that. Uh, you know, Peter is the one that says, no, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be the one that's washing the feet. Presumably he was sitting uh, in the configuration in the upper room where the, where the youngest or, or one of the servants would sit uh, to wash the feet. So it is a um, it is a very dramatic moment because it teaches them about the true nature of leadership, and and I have always appreciated that. Uh, the second thing that Jesus does is he transforms the ancient custom of hospitality, a custom of the law of Moses, and inaugurates this new ordinance, uh, which becomes, as it were, a symbol of ultimate acceptance by the Lord. Uh, the Joseph Smith translation of John chapter 13, verse 10, is quite clear that this is, uh, this is a custom, or was a custom of the law of Moses, and is then transformed. Uh, and John, the Joseph Smith translation of John chapter 13, verse 10, 
quote, now this was the custom of the Jews under their law, wherefore Jesus did this, that the law might be fulfilled. And and it certainly is not only fulfilled, but it it it, uh, it takes discipleship to a whole new level because this is the ordinance that's the exact opposite of the ordinance of condemnation, which is the dusting of the feet, which we read about right. in the New Testament. So this and, and is it, the oh please this is the symbol that says yes you're you're accepted you're commended by the Lord you are truly one of His followers absolutely and and it, it, our audience it may be helped to know like it, this is what you did when someone was welcomed into your home they became part of your household or, or they're they're part of your home they're they're welcome and belong there and uh, and I think that's part of why. When uh, Peter says, "Don't don't wash my feet," Jesus says, "Then I have you have no part in me, right? Uh, if you want to have part of the Savior, you need to become part of His household, and uh, so that's part of what this is. Uh, that's a lot of use of the words part, but uh, that's this is part of what this is about. I think is saying you are now with me in my household, and yeah. I am in the Father's household, and so it's this relationship and unity." Uh, that is uh, being highlighted that he'll highlight so much in the teachings that he'll proceed to after this. Yeah. And, and even archeology span has uh, demonstrated the nature of this custom uh, in certain areas, a couple specifically that I can think of where you walk in to homes of the, of the more affluent uh, in the, in Jesus's day in Roman Palestine. And you'll see um, a little a pool uh, that's constructed in the mosaic floor, presumably where the servants would welcome the guests into the house, and that little depression there would be filled with water, and the servants would wash the feet uh, of those uh, who entered, and and uh, and that that was always a graphic reminder of this ordinance. And then the third thing that Jesus does by the washing, the at least the third thing, is he seals upon the apostles their exaltation, and. Um, and it makes them clean from the blood and sins uh, of the world. Uh, this ultimate ordinance of commendation rather than the twin ordinance of ultimate condemnation. And uh, those who hold the, the keys to perform this are uh, those who hold the keys of the priesthood, namely uh, apostles and prophets uh, in our day. And uh, this uh, this ordinance, as I said, was is was reinstituted or restored is a better um, phrase um, on um, well the first reference to it I think is in uh, 1832 uh, when the school of the prophets uh, is commanded to be organized and the Lord says you shall not receive any. Uh, among you into this school, except he be clean from the blood of this generation, and he's received by the ordinance of the washing of the feet, uh, uh, quote unquote, and that's in section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And then uh, in March, uh, March 29th and 30th of 1836, uh, the leading brethren, the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, the the bishoprics in the presence of quorums participated in the washing of the feet. And so uh, Latter-day Saints pay particular attention to this because this really is, uh, I guess, if we can call it the ultimate ordinance of acceptance into uh, the Lord's house, as you have mentioned, into our Father's house and into our Father's kingdom. Uh, and I'm not aware of any other group that um, has such an expanded knowledge of this ordinance that as much as the Latter-day Saints do. So this is a, a powerful thing to keep in mind. And, uh, and ultimately, I guess we should say that it doesn't really make any difference whether one receives this ordinance of mortality or after uh, this mortal life is over. I mean, it can only be administered by you know, 15 men <laughs> on the earth, and they can't get to the entire population of the church. So section 50 
uh, of the doctrine and covenants is whether in this life or in the next life doesn't make any difference, but it's an ordinance that will um, that will indicate that yeah, we're we're accepted of the Lord, and I can't think of a greater blessing uh, that, than that. So the last thing to be said about this is what we've alluded to before: the washing of the feet in the upper room after the establishment of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper transforms the Last Supper, as it were, into a temple meeting. And I, I liked uh, uh, so much the, your description of uh, the, our chapels being transformed into ordinance rooms and with priesthood holders as ordinance workers. Well, this happened in the upper room where it's because of the sacred nature of it, the upper room becomes, as it were, a temple room or a temple meeting in part. So that's that's what uh, happens uh, on Monday, Thursday night. Two great ordinances that are that are instituted and continue to bless our lives as Latter Day Saints, and uh, and then those that uh, will want a more full appreciation of that who will become covenant members. Uh, through our missionary efforts, we'll bless their lives as well. Amen. And then maybe if it's all right, Andy, I can just comment on uh, some of the the teachings. Uh, there are so, some of the most profound teachings in anywhere in Scripture are given that night. They're all in, in John, basically chapter the end of chapter 13, but chapter 14 through 17. And we, we just won't have time to really go into those here. Uh, but I did want to point out, uh, if we're thinking of this as uh, kind of having become a temple room, uh, or the, the the room having become a, a kind of temple, uh, think about our temples, that, that we receive ordinances and we also receive instruction. And in the end, that instruction is about how, after having left God's purpose, or God's presence, we can return to his presence and be united with him. And that's really the emphasis of those teaching of those teachings that the savior gives uh, from beginning to end there are all sorts of other little elements of it but from beginning to end the major theme in chapters 14 through 17 is being unified with Christ and him making us unified with God uh, and and so i find that another striking parallel with the the temple nature of this and we'll just refer our audience to so that that idea of unity in the teachings is one i explore in my little easter book the easter connection uh, I know you explore these teachings a lot in your uh, kind of combined book that we we mentioned before, The Last Week of the Savior's Life, um, and of course your uh, verse-by-verse -verse commentary that you did with Kelly Ogden. You uh, go through uh, all of these teachings and, and give great commentary, and so while we won't be able to, to go into, I mean, we could spend more than an hour on each of those chapters and still not plumb the depths of them, but uh, we'll just skip across them here uh, so we can get to an even more important element of, of uh, Maundy Thursday. But I'll refer our audience to those resources uh, so that they can get more out of this. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, uh, the teachings uh, about the Holy Ghost in and of itself could, could fill a whole semester, yeah. uh, as, as you point out. So thank you for, for that uh, excellent summary. Uh, on Monday, Thursday, um, not a, a lot of attention is paid to Jesus's experience in Gethsemane that comes after Jesus leaves the upper room. Uh, there is some attention paid to it. Uh, they and, and by uh, that you mean uh, among our other Christian uh, among friends. our among yeah. our other Christian denominations, uh, they uh, some do. Um, try to recreate the atmosphere of the Garden of Gethsemane, where we have a chance, they have a chance to sit in silent contemplation about Jesus's prayer. Uh, but for Latter-day Saints, uh, Gethsemane is where we see the continuation of an eternal theme, as it were, in the life of Jesus. And that eternal theme, of course, is the fulfilling of the Father's will in all things. This is uh, something of a culmination of, of that uh, special theme, which uh, Jesus described and discussed uh, throughout his mortal life. But we first read about uh, this 
this um, great desire on the part of Jesus to do what his father wanted him to do and nothing else. Uh, as we read about uh, the great council described in the um, book of Moses, chapter four, and uh, Jesus there says uh, that he will be the father's son to come down in mortality to leave his throne. Uh, he was the great Jehovah. And he says, uh, paraphrasing, quote, Father, thy will be done. Your will will be done and the glory will be yours forever. And that's not what uh, the, the, the other participant in the dialogue says. Uh, that, of course, Lucifer, the son of the morning and a pretty smart guy, according to the scriptures, an angel in authority in the presence of God takes the exact opposite point of view, wants to dethrone the father, take the glory for himself, and completely eliminate uh, the fundamental principle of agency, of moral agency. And so from the very beginning, we see that this that Jesus it, wants to do nothing more than what the father wants him to do. Um, in mortality, we see on different occasions Jesus saying, uh, more particularly in the synagogue at Capernaum. And I remember being there with you. This is a vivid memory that I have with our students from the BYU Jerusalem Center, where we described and discussed how Jesus says to the, the Jewish people in that synagogue, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the yeah. will of him that sent me, yep. which is a, a powerful teaching. And then, of course, he, he foreshadows the sacrament. Uh, other occasions where Jesus says, I can do nothing of myself, but, uh, but because uh, I, I, I don't seek, because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And then finally in Gethsemane, that late Thursday night or, or early, early uh, Friday morning, where uh, the pain and the suffering of the atoning sacrifice becomes so great that, that Jesus asks his father if there isn't another way, if it's possible, please remove this bitter cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, what I will, but what thou wilt. And for me, um, it this, I guess I'm uh, bearing my soul here. Don't want to make it too heavy, but for for me, this is the summation of uh, Jesus's whole existence. Yes, uh, it's not just Holy Week, but everything that Jesus did, um, and and then even uh, more dramatically, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, uh, one of the, well, in fact, I think the last of the seven statements that he makes while he's hanging on the cross, the Bible says um, it is finished, and he gives up the ghost. But the Joseph Smith translation, which is one of the, the great blessings that we have as Latter-day Saints, has Jesus saying, Father, it is finished. Thy will is done. Mm -hmm. And then he gave up the ghost. And so uh, Matthew 27, 50, the Joseph Smith translation, that translation takes us back full circle to that premortal council where Jesus first says, I will be thy son, and thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. And so this is a an amazing um, capstone on that that whole theme. And, and, and of course, uh, a thought just occurred to me, because this is the Book of Mormon year, how does Jesus introduce himself right. to the Nephites in 3rd Nephi chapter 11? Of all the things he could have chosen to say by way of introduction, what does he say? He says, the very first thing he Jesus says, Christ, and I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. Yes. Well, that that to me says that this, re he understands that this is the summation of his existence as he's done the will of the Father. And, and we, again, are so blessed because we have this added uh, instruction and information uh, yeah. given to us by the Book of Mormon. 
It's it's beautiful, and and I love what you're saying there. You know, if uh, it's the the Gospel of John is where you find that theme taught so consistently in almost every chapter. There are a couple, I think, two chapters where it's not a theme, but in every other chapter of the Gospel of John, you have this theme where Christ says, "I just do the Father's will." Yeah, it's 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 uh, not as much in the other Gospels, but it's so much in John that still numerically, it's the most common thing he talks about in all four Gospels because it's so much in the Gospel of John. But I think it's significant that. Here at the at the end, when he is really um, manifesting or, or really suffering and going through with what he came here to do, that the other gospel writers are highlighting that theme as well. Uh, so that uh, in, in the end, I think w- we could say that uh, what the Savior is saying there is that he is letting God prevail in his life. Uh, to the point where he does nothing except for let God prevail in his life. Uh, and uh, that's what we're seeking to emulate as well. And, and there's one other point. I, I hope you don't mind me uh, making a couple of more comments. Uh, what we learn from the Savior is that the Father's will involved the Savior's suffering. Yes. Uh, that's a sobering thought. And the Gospels, particularly uh, Mark and Luke, and, and uh, Matthew, give us an appreciation for how the Savior's suffering affected him in Gethsemane. But the Gospels don't say very much about what caused the suffering. In fact, I can't think of any uh, particular pointed statements that talk about what caused the, the suffering. Uh, if we look at Mark chapter 14, uh, we we get an we get an appreciation for what the suffering brought about, uh, and starting with verse thirty two of Mark fourteen. They came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and that's significant because we know Gethsemane is uh, the two Hebrew words put together: Gath meaning press and Sheman meaning oil, and mm-hmm. and, and and this is on the. Mount of Olives. There's no other kind of oil that's processed there except for uh, pure olive oil. And so it's the place of the olive oil press. And he takes with him Peter, James, and John. Well, he he takes uh, the uh, the eleven apostles and uh, has them sit. One supposes near the entrance to the garden. Then he takes with him Peter, James, and John, and says the text says began to be sore amazed. And to be very heavy. And he says, my sorrow, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. And he went, goes a little further and uh, falls on the ground and prays that it's possible. And uh, uses the Aramaic word for, for father, Abba, uh, all things are possible and so on. So uh, the, the, the two questions that usually arise in our discussions with our students, uh, presumably, is um, what caused Jesus to be surprised uh, and and what caused him to be weighed down to the extent that he felt like he was going to die? Or, or maybe even uh, Mark is telling us he felt such weight that he felt like he was going to be crushed uh, 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 by the weight. And I think uh, if we take the second question first, uh, what caused him to feel heavy and feel um, like he was on the point of dying, I think we all would say, well, obviously it's the weight of sin. It's the it's the weight of sin individually, each one of us, and it's the collective weight of the fallen world, the collective weight of, of that sin, because the earth has to be redeemed in, in all of this. And the, and the and, sorrow uh, associated with that sin and the the pain and everything associated with it, right? Exactly. But but even more than that, it, it's the it's the sorrow, the suffering, the injustice, the unfairness that comes to all of us yes. to a greater or lesser extent because of the nature of this fallen world. So it isn't just the sin, although that is <clears throat> infinite in its scope in its reach, but it's for the sorrow, for the suffering, for the unfairness, the injustice. The griefs, the afflictions. Yeah, through no fault of our of our own. That's all part 
of this atoning experience as Alma chapter seven describes. But even more than that, we're still not done, is the sin, sorrow, suffering, unfairness, and injustice for all of the other worlds, millions of earths like this one that Jesus created under the direction of his father. That's all part of this infinite suffering that takes place in this uh, peaceful little garden in a small little outpost on the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and yet it affects the entire universe. Uh, and and I, I'm just stunned by that. And, and yes. one of the great sections of Dr. Covenants that we can read, section 76, verses 23 and 24, and then 42 and 43, we come away appreciating that in Gethsemane, Jesus began that suffering for all that he created. That truly is, is uh, infinite suffering. And there's and, a state, excuse me, uh, there's a statement by Elder Maxwell that I I really go back to time and time again. And uh, this uh, is taken from the church news, June 19th, 1999. Quote, imagine Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. He had mm -hmm. never personally known the exquisite and exacting process of an atonement before. The cumulative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon that perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. All of our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow, too, a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. That's a phrase that I ask my students to memorize, the yeah. awful arithmetic of the atonement. In this extremity, did he perhaps, or excuse me, perchance, hope for a rescuing ram in the thicket? This is a reference to, of course, Abraham and his son Isaac. Elder Maxwell continues, I do not know. His suffering, as it were, enormity multiplied by infinity, evoked his later soul cry on the cross, and it was a cry of forsakenness. And so we come to appreciate on this Thursday, this Monday Thursday celebration or commemoration, the fact that Jesus redeemed all he created and it happened on this planet and why we are so blessed to be part of this planet's existence as opposed to the millions of us that he created, I uh, believe has to do with what happened in our pre-mortal existence. But we're so blessed to 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 have this uh, experience and to have this instruction and this information, uh, which blesses our lives for eternity, really. Yes. A Amen. And, uh, you know, as you talk about that and, and his uh, feeling like he was going to die uh, and so on, uh, it, it makes me think, if I understand the phrase, at least this is my understanding of the phrase, uh, that he suffered more than mortal man can suffer uh, except to be unto death. Uh, I think that the pressures, that, that that pressing that we talk about, the the suffering, the enormity, that awful arithmetic of what he went through was so much that it it was enough to kill the mortal body before he'd done all the suffering he needed to do. But because he had the ability to choose not to die, he had inherited that from his father. And because he had that ability, <clears throat> he he didn't die. It was it, his body was past the point of death. And yet he continued, he chose to continue to suffer. And it would seem to me that it's in the midst of that, that if I, I hope it's not a, a sacrilegious to paraphrase here, that uh, beautiful phrase that you've mentioned, but it seems to me he was saying, uh, Father, this is so hard. If there's any other way to do it, I'd like to do it a different way. I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I'd like to not do this. And then, of course, he did it. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that's a point that we that we sometimes overlook. There is that amazing verse in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and, and your uh, discussion helped me to think of this, where Jesus is talking about uh, the blessing of repenting. 
And he says in section 19, verse 17, if they will not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. And then there's a dash yeah. right there. And that that is one of the most amazing dashes in any document you find, because I think what's happening is that the savior with his perfect memory is remembering exactly what happened and exactly the way he felt. And he, he doesn't want to go on describing it because it brings back all of those feelings. And, and you're exactly right. This, this is, this is a son who's saying to his father, or, or as some like to say, Abba, meaning daddy, it certainly does in, in modern Hebrew, uh, daddy, papa, I don't want to go through this. Please take it away. Precisely because it was so great, the pressure was so great that it caused him to bleed from every pore. Um, Jerome Murphy O'Connor, uh, who's one of the uh, great uh, biblical geographers, but also uh, a really wonderful New Testament scholar uh, says in his, his research that he finds the word in uh, Mark chapter 14, uh, surprise, I, uh, what's the, what's the exact language? Um, uh, I think it's sore amazed or something, began sore, to be sore, sore amazed, amazed sore which amazed. I think is actually a word that's like terrified, but anyway, yeah, sorry, keep going. It's, it's the Greek word ekstombestai, yeah. um, which doesn't particularly raise me to new uh, heights of spirituality, but the meaning does because he says it means terrified surprise. Yeah. And what is it that causes terrified surprise? The fact that he is perfect. He's never experienced what sin feels like. He's never experienced the effects of sin because he is perfectly sensitized to sin, and now it comes crushing down on him all at once. Not just the sin, sorrow, and suffering of, of this world and the people on it, but the sin, sorrow, and suffering of all of those who inhabit the millions of earths like this. And it happens in this moment in this garden. No wonder he's surprised and no wonder he's terrified. Uh, there, there is a an, another thing that uh, I guess we can mention. Uh, I know we have to wrap up, but um, Elder Talmadge in his book, um, Jesus the Christ, makes an amazing statement about who else is in the garden that night. And of course, as you would suspect, the other being in the garden is none other than Lucifer. And uh, this is the way he puts it. I just happened to, I, I, I loved this quote so much, I've got it pasted in my scriptures. This is a Jesus the Christ, page 613. Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable by finite mind, both as to intensity and cause. He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has ever lived on earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain or mental anguish that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an exclusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. In that hour of anguish, Christ met and overcame all the horrors that Satan, the prince of this world, could inflict. There was another being in the garden besides the 11 apostles and Jesus, and that was the adversary, throwing everything at the Savior to try to get him to retreat from this. And the culminating thing that happens if we can say that the perhaps the uh ultimate insult that causes him to bleed from every pore is what president brigham young says the withdrawal of heavenly father's spirit completely from the son so i'll i'll conclude with this uh because we have several other things that we want to talk about but Brigham Young goes so far as to state that it was the withdrawal of Heavenly Father from his son 
and hence the withdrawal of the spiritual powers of light and life uh, from the Father that caused Jesus to sweat blood. And this is what President Young said, quote, if he, Jesus, had had the power of God upon him, he would not have sweat blood. But all was withdrawn from him, and a veil was cast over him, unquote. So the point is, is that Jesus always had Heavenly Father's spirit, his influence, his power to be with him. The Joseph Smith translation of John chapter 3, verse 34 says, The spirit is given to us mortals by measure. That is to say, we didn't have it. It comes and goes with us as fallen beings. But Jesus always had it. He, there was never a time when he didn't. And now Heavenly Father withdraws that influence. And the pressure, the pain, the agony is so great, it causes him to bleed from every pore. And there's a medical condition called hematidrosis. Uh, it's not, it's very rare. It's described in medical journals, but it's mortal beings who experience such pressure, such pain that it causes the capillaries in their system to burst and, and thus bleed from every pore as, as the blood is mixed with sweat. And so there's a physical cause that we can point to, but the spiritual cause is, as President Young says, the withdrawal of Heavenly Father's Spirit uh, and I am so grateful that Jesus chose to subject himself to these contradictions. Uh, Jesus was the least deserving of all that happened to him. He was perfect. He was the beloved son. But when it came to satisfying the demands of justice, he took full force all of the punishment that I deserved, all of the punishment that you and everyone else deserved, and he took it, absorbed it to himself, took the, the force of, of that, the demands of justice, and that's what, in effect, we remember when we think about uh, his, his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, we hope that this allows uh, our audience to, to take some time today and give some serious contemplation and uh, commemoration and expressions of gratitude to God who loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son to do this very thing that we've been talking about. And we hope you'll join, uh, join us as we tomorrow talk about the trials and the the crucifixion, which is still part of that atoning sacrifice and his suffering. And so uh, we look forward to uh, visiting with you all tomorrow.